All right, uh, uh, moving from controversy, then political cartooning, freedom of speech, uh, and social activism to women entrepreneurship. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am going to present you a young uh, uh, woman who has excelled in social entrepreneurship and is uh, recognized globally for her work. She was there in US for some times, but uh, it is that connect with India that has brought her over here. And despite coming from a good family and uh, having a good background, who could have done uh, a great lot of activities and made money in business, she didn't prefer to do so. And Forbes magazine has rated her as top 100 woman, most powerful woman in this 2014. Presenting to you is Ajeta Sah. Can I have you, Ajeta, here? And uh, she is the CEO of Frontier Marketing, a company that empowers women through solar energy. She has started her process in the state of Rajasthan, and she plans to take it to the various parts of the country. I have also uh, given my support to her so that I will also contribute whatever she does it. What, one thing that strikes me very uh, uh, mostly important, uh, most important is her innovation and creativity and she doesn't give up and uh, she prospers uh, like, a, uh, like, uh, like a powerful uh, force to the audience and to the crowd at large and gives that message to the audience. Can I have Ajata Sah, please? Ladies and gentlemen, please give a huge round of applause to Ajata Sah, please. Thank you. Uh, we don't have my presentation here, which is unfortunate because I'd love to have shared some photos of uh, the work that we were doing um, on the ground. But first, before I start, um, I just want to thank uh, Satya Ji and, of course, uh, Media 7 and um, India Affairs for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's definitely really hard to follow after a seam, but still, I'll try. Um, so before I get started, I just wanted to actually give a little bit more background on uh, myself and why I decided to set up uh, the organization that I did. And also, um, what I think is happening in India when it comes to uh, women empowerment and what we're seeing is going to be the future of true social activism with a perspective of uh, profitability and sustainability. So um, many times when people, they ask me about the work that I do, they typically say, um, so I heard you're running a, a fantastic nonprofit. And um, I always look at them and I smile and I say, actually, it's a social business. And um, no one really understands what a social business is. Because either in India you are a commercial business that makes a lot of money and uh, grows very big, um, and you don't care about anything in terms of the impact that you achieve, or you're a nonprofit that doesn't understand how to sustain itself, and you're constantly depending on grants, and, you're not, uh, and your entire story is about impact. It's not about sustainability, it's not about careers, it's not about profitability, um, and the two, if put together, uh, are the most confusing things people hear, or it sounds like it's blasphemous, that it's not possible. So when I set up Frontier Markets, um, I set it up after working in India for five years uh, in microfinance. And for all of you uh, that may not know, microfinance is something that started many years ago in India where we focused on wanting to uh, empower women by giving them access to loans. And one of the biggest reasons why uh, this model was focused on women was because there was a very clear understanding of who that woman was in a household. She was someone who was pretty selfish, selfless. She was someone who uh, very much focused on the well-being of her children. Uh, when she was looking at taking money, she was so conscious about wanting to repay it that she constantly thought about innovating of how to utilize that money to set up a business. And if we compare where microfinance started in India in the South, 
Uh, most of the times why people justified that women should be the ones getting the loan, it was because they said, we know that the women will do something productive with this, whereas the men will probably use it and get drunk. And so it was an interesting dynamic looking at how in rural and slum areas in India, microfinance became a central point of focusing on why smart loans can be given to women as a smart investment because there's someone who's trying to get their households out of poverty. Now, in that moment, what was interesting was that women were always told to uh, pick a business activity that was already available in these rural villages or slums. So you had retail shops there, you had people that were doing farming, you had people that were creating, um, using animal husbandry, create, working with milk. So there was no innovation. Because these are the existing markets or because these are the existing uh, employment activities or businesses that are available, this is what we can train women in doing. Because they're illiterate, they don't have access to proper education. Uh, they don't have a mindset or the ability to think outside of the box. What will they do in terms of expanding their business? Let's keep them focused in this area. And that was the biggest mistake that I think we were doing um, for the many years as we were looking at how to alleviate or empower women. We started boxing them without even realizing we were boxing them. Um, and one of the biggest things that I remember when I was working um, in India in microfinance, a woman said, you know, I'm not illiterate because I don't want, because I'm not smart. I'm illiterate because I didn't have an opportunity. And the people that deny me of the opportunities are the same people that are putting me in this box, help me come out of this box. So as I was working in, um, in India, and I worked in about uh, six states of India, uh, covered about 25,000 villages myself, and probably spent time with almost 125,000 different families uh, trying to understand what exactly are your needs, what is your life like, and why is it that we're not helping you or you're not helping yourself get out of this vicious cycle. And one of the things that we need to understand, and I know earlier we were giving some stats about how many people live in rural India, and we said about 68%, and that we should urbanize them. And that made me cringe a little bit because I always think about where the productivity and where the lifestyle is. Rural households love their atmosphere. And I don't know how many of you have spent time in rural villages, but I would live there in a heartbeat versus a dirty urban slum. And to, un to force people to migrate to find opportunities versus seeing innovation within your own rural village is an unfortunate thing that we're starting to create as a mindset. So the 68% that are living in rural India today are living a very frustrated life. I mean, it's a fact. They don't have innovative income generating opportunities. We're not giving them proper skill sets. We're not thinking that they're going to be able to uh, empower themselves to get out and innovate for what they need in their homes. And we're not giving them access to some of the basic utilities that we have. Today we're sitting in a room with ample amount of lighting and you know, if my PowerPoint turns off, I won't, my life won't change. The reality is that rural villagers today are living with horrible access to water, horrible access to healthcare, horrible access to electricity. If you go into a rural village today and you say, aapki sabse badi samasya kya hai? They will always say bijli and pani. And the reality is that even where there's places where there's some electricity, it's not reliable, right? And if there's no predictability in how you're gonna be getting power to do, to be productive, power to cook, power to study, lights, and actually just living a normal life, you can't even entertain yourself with a TV that's sitting in your village because you have no idea when the power is going to come on. So frankly, you're just leaving this life of massive unpredictability, which in itself is super frustrating. It's very, very frustrating. And then we start questioning why we're not actually creating productivity or income in rural villages. It's our fault. But is it completely our fault? And the answer is no, because at the end of the day, in order for people to make changes in their lives, they have to be the ones involved in that movement. And that's really what uh, Frontier Markets' goal was. Having lived in these villages myself and seeing the frustration, I've seen so many children die of kerosene fires because that was the option for lighting. And seeing people run in villages in darkness and not fall. I fell 17 times because I don't know the roots in darkness, but these villages did. And they would say, we'd rather live in darkness than deal with death. But that's not the solution. 
The solution is to find a new way in innovation. So we looked at solar. Now everyone knows solar in India has been around for 25 plus years. And it seems like it's an obvious solution. And we keep talking about gigawatts and megawatts and all these different projects that we're going to do in solar. But what about getting it to that rural household that's been waiting for electricity since we became independent? So the question is, if solar is so fantastic, why hasn't it been the obvious solution for rural villages? The reality is that people don't have access to solar. They have no idea the benefits of solar. They don't even know how solar functions. Any experience that they've gotten with solar has been either low quality solutions because it's been a subsidy program. Someone has come in with a tender and dropped in something cheap and there's zero accountability. They don't understand how to even maximize the use of solar. So if they, if, even if it is a good product or a good solar solution, there's a good chance curiosity is gonna make them wanna power something else and the system's gonna blow up. And then there's no one there for after sale service. So they don't trust it. And the fourth most important thing is that for that reason, they don't wanna pay for it. Because if I have 500 rupees or 1,000 rupees or even 10,000 rupees in my pocket, I'm gonna think twice about what I wanna spend on. And I'm not gonna invest on something that I don't trust, I don't understand, and I don't understand the relevance for it. So when we set up Frontier Markets, we said let's address these issues. Let's really work on educating rural households about what the value of solar can be for them. Let's also ensure that we, we understand what their problems are versus dictating what we think their problems are. So we spent a lot of time understanding stories about who these rural households are and what their lives really are and is in fact kerosene a reality? And is in fact darkness a reality? Is in fact frustration a reality? Um, and, the, and once we did that, we also started educating them on solar. Today, if you and I are customers and we're gonna buy the new iPhone that comes out, we wanna know what is the difference between the iPhone 6 and the Samsung 6. We wanna know what is the cost structure. We wanna know what are gonna be the bargains we're gonna get. We wanna know what the warranty is. We wanna know all the different availabilities and options I have. So what is the difference between us buying an iPhone 6 and a rural household wanting to invest in a solar lantern? There is no difference, but we're not giving them choice. We're not giving them options. We're not believing that they're true customers. So no matter what the great and latest great CK Parla had said, fortune on the bottom of the pyramid, if they're not true customers, you're not treating them that way, then there's a massive disconnect here. So we started educating rural households about the different kinds of solar solutions that are there, how it can apply to them. But the most important thing was to build access locally. So if a rural household today buys a, um, agri seed, a plant, or you know, a light bulb, or anything to do in a panchayat, if they go to their rural retailer, why not actually bring that solar solution there? Why not make it easier for them to actually purchase a solar product if they actually want it? Now, so what do we do? They know about solar, they think it's a pretty neat idea, they see that it's available or accessible because there's a farmer somewhere in their panchayat that's willing to stock these products, but then how do they trust the solution? And that's where after sales service comes in. So what we did was we actually started working with women. Now, a lot of people always say to me, oh, Ajeta, are you doing this for the impact story? Is it an impact story that you've involved women into uh, your business model? And I say, no, it's smart business. Women like hearing from women and men like speaking to women. And it turns out women are just better suited to deal with complaints. And it turns out women are also much better at multitasking. And it turns out when women have to prove something, because they're being told that they're not good at anything or that they cannot leave this village or because they're uneducated, there's no opportunity for them. They're very aggressive. They're very aggressive, they're very passionate and they're very excited to get an opportunity. And when you train them on basic repair and you train them on basic systems about how solar functions and you actually help them get excited about their own frustrations and teach them to become a change maker, they blow your minds. They're phenomenal. So these women become the uh, core central point of the entire model. They educate households about what rural solutions are available for them. Suddenly, even the mother-in-laws are telling them that my business is the best because everyone goes to it. Because they are the smart and the best. Because even the Sarpanch is now going to her and saying, Bina, if I have to play a TV here, then I will put a vodka system in my Right? Which is the power in this, right? And she's then earning income. 
She's earning income on service. She's earning income on data. She's earning income on sales. And now that farmer, who traditionally in Rajasthan is a man, is now depending on this woman to help grow his business in solar as well. And this has kind of been, you know, the theme of what we wanted to create. Uh, so in Rajasthan, we've created a thousand who we call Solar Sahelis. Uh, we've been partnering with a lot of NGOs that have been working with self-help uh, self groups. And now Rajasthan government want us, wants us to scale this to four and a half lakh women. Uh, we've created about 800 farmer retailers. We've sold about 90,000 um, solar solutions in rural Rajasthan. Uh, and this is just the beginning. We've created smart solutions. So I like someone who said, why not smart villages? Because uh, we've actually brought in censoring and smart metering into streetlights and villages, because let's be honest, when you have ample amount of shop lighting and other lighting available in cities, but when rural villages you don't have any outdoor lighting, it's a really big problem because your toilets are outside in the field. So there's a lot of other factors here. So we're using IoT and monitoring to kind of make this thing work. And now that Solar Saheli is using a smart cell phone, and she's the one who's actually putting in the data, checking on the solar streetlights that need to be repaired instantly. Customer service no longer is something where the household is chasing the provider, but the provider is change, chasing the customer, telling them, Ki, boss, I need to check your system. It might not be working. So it's a really big impact um, that can be created. Um, and one of the reasons why I was excited to come here was because um, I wanted, I two major things that I wanted to have people have a takeaway on. Uh, one is that social businesses are a reality, um, and unfortunately, they're not being acknowledged enough, um, and they're kind of becoming the orphan child of this sector. So you're either for profit or nonprofit. Um, and the gentleman that talked about CSR, the 2%, it's, it's a funny thing because you have all these corporates that are going, I wish there was a sustainable model to create scalable impact. And I say, Welcome to the world of social entrepreneurship. That's what we do. Um, the second thing that I wanted to make sure that everybody um, knew, so for the last couple of months, there's been a lot of press and media that's been following me. They're like, where are all the women? Where are all the women in social entrepreneurship? And so they always are trying to force me to say, Ajita, talk about your journey. Talk about how challenging it's been for you to be a social entrepreneur. And I even had one person quote going, you know, for male entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurship is tough because it's, you know, access to finance is really challenging. Uh, the areas that you're working in has very really low infrastructure and you're working with a very tough community. So this is typically the challenge for male entrepreneurs. What is more challenging for women entrepreneurs? And I looked at them and I said, are you kidding? This is a challenge across the board. Male or, male or female, we as social entrepreneurs always face the same challenges. And now let's change this dialogue because the more you make me talk about how challenging it is to be a woman entrepreneur, the more you're preventing more women from coming into this sector. And the more you're actually creating an honestly an injustice uh, reality of negative impact because it turns out Women leaders that have been doing work in this space have been the most successful. And what's also been very interesting is to see that why everyone talks about when you know your market, you know, the best businesses know their market. The best businesses know their market. Our market are vulnerable rural households. And it turns out women are more better at connecting with them than others. So when we're looking at opportunities and we're trying to understand, you know, what does it mean to empower women and get them into social entrepreneurship? The point is that it's not just about women like me, it's rural women, it's urban women, it's um, adolescent girls, it's really about th talking about a much larger movement that needs to happen. And we need to all really start understanding that we have assets that make us perfect for this role versus talking about why it's challenging for us because we can start breaking that norm in that dialogue. So thank you. So, Ajita, you made a point about uh, the solar uh, electricity in the rural villages. I know it is very difficult in India at present uh, uh, to raise funds, basically, to supply those things. I also know that you have been working for the public-private partnership to reach out to those people. So, how you have faced this, what are the problems you have faced while getting the funds and getting it implemented? and making people smile through the electricity actually. 
Could you reveal that story to us? Sure. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, when when you're again a social business is that uh, the kind of investors that you're attracting are still the same as commercial businesses. They all want fast growth. They all want 30 x returns. They all want 18 to 22 percent IRRs, and they all want it to happen within one to three years. And then you kind of look at them with a blank stare going, you understand that my customer cannot afford the product that I'm trying to sell them. You understand that we have to actually educate them and build a market that was never established before. You understand that this is not a three-year story, this is a 10-year story. You understand the IRRs will never be that kind of level, but we can actually slowly incrementally get there. And so I think that um, that education piece of really having people understand that um, the sacrifice that you're making uh, for running a social business versus working a, running a commercial business is that you're emphasizing 50% on profitability and sustainability, which, mind you, does happen because we know it's happened in the microfinance sector. But it's also about really being sincere about the impact that you're trying to create. And so when we share our numbers, we don't just say, here's the revenue we generated, here's the number of products we sold, here are the number of customers we created. We say, here's the num dollars saved in solar for rural households. Here's the impact that's been created on productivity. Here are the people whose income generation has increased. And when you look at the scale potential of this, it becomes millions, not just a couple you, hundred thousand Can you tell dollars. us uh, what is the level of uh, employment it would create for the woman so that they will be self-sufficient? Because I understand that you have some Saheli program where right. you are doing this. So what is that number that you're looking at where the woman could be employed and uh, can be counted in this. Sure, so um, right now we just, when we started this about a year and a half ago, so this is an addition to our program. Um, we've empowered a thousand women uh, who are earning an income now of about 6,000 to 7,000 rupees a month. Okay. Um, and total since we started, we've about, uh, a, in terms of the women that we've empowered, uh, we've helped generate for them about $2 million worth of income generated. Um, but there's also a savings component here and a productivity component. So when you suddenly have access to reliable power in the evenings, you're able to maximize that time. And we're having women now starting their sewing machine businesses, their purse makers, they're um, going actually in the evening and drying and working on their crops. They're feeling more comfortable because they have reliable access. So it's not just about income generated from the business. It's about money saved from solar and then it's also productivity increased in terms of income when you bring in solar into rural villages. On a personal level for your company, how much money you make while doing this? How much money do I make? Yeah. How do you file income tax as well? I do file income taxes. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, I think uh, promoters and founders are always um, interesting as social entrepreneurs. Everyone, everyone calls us robotic, crazy, and um, they always wonder when we're going to burn out. Um, so I've been doing this for five years with my own company. And then, of course, uh, five years earlier, I was working with other startups. So we make no money. Like, I make no money. But um, my company makes money. Uh, we, where that money goes? Where does the money go? Uh, to growth. So what we do is, um, you know, today we're just in Rajasthan. We're in 17 districts. Rajasthan is 33 districts. Uh, we have demand of going into MP, Maharashtra, Jharkhand, and Bihar. I mean, let's be honest. All of India really needs to have a more focused distribution solution for bringing access to solar solutions uh, with trust. And um, so we have, a lot to, we have a lot of money to pump back in to then grow to actually reach the numbers that we want to achieve. But the other part of this that I'll say is that, um, you know, true scale can only happen if you're doing government partnerships, right? Because at the end of the day, I look at this as their responsibility. Um, and we're just kind of enabling the start of this. So what's been exciting about in Rajasthan is that there's a lot more uh, focus on this. And people are understanding that Rajasthan is not going to be uh, productive.